morning. Good to be in the presence of the Lord, isn't it? I'll tell you, we were um, praying before service, and just as we were praying, I got, this, I got this picture in my mind of God looking down with his glory in his hands, ready to pour it out on us. And he's only started. He's only started. And so I'm excited when we, when we worship. And as we were singing that last song, and Lord, you are good, and you are you know, just worthy of praise. And as I could just hear your voices rising, and I was just praising God and, and thanking him as, and just saying, listen to the praises of your people. What an awesome time that we have to spend in worship. And, and Jake, thank you for, for leading us in that uh, for faithfully all of these years. Can we give Jake a hand just to say thank you? for all that he has done. And like he said, he's not going anywhere except just to the sound booth. So, uh, you know, we're still going to see him around, but definitely come out tonight at 7 o'clock, and uh, we're going to have some cake and some coffee, just celebrate Jake and all of his, uh, you know, contributions to to us and the way that he's served us over the years. So uh, please be prepared to come uh, out to that. Um, You know, as I think about it, it's hard to believe that it's already October, and that there are only 60 days until we walk through Bethlehem. And so we've got a lot to do for that. But we also have an outreach coming up this month uh, on Halloween. So remember, we, need, uh, we still need about three families uh, that are willing to host uh, at their house. Uh, and you would be, you know, inviting other members of the church to your house. And you would be handing out candy, uh, you know, and the love of God to the people in your neighborhood. You just put, you know, some tables out in your front yard uh, on your driveway. And then interact with your neighbors and share with them uh, just who God is and love them, love on them. And, you know, so if you're willing to do that, we have about three uh, families already uh, that have signed up. If you want to do that, con- contact Nicole. Uh, if you say, well, I, I don't really live in a neighborhood where there are a lot of children, or I'd rather go to someone's house and help them there. Again, contact Nicole uh, with that, or you can also call the church office. Uh, but we need everybody to bring candy because uh, we want to give out good candy, right? Like king size candy bars. And we want them to know that God loves them, um, you know, I said the other day, like, bit of honey. Like, if I got bit of honey, I mean, that's going in the garbage, right? But uh, I, I, Carol says that's her favorite. I, I would give it to Carol. I wouldn't throw it away. Uh, but if I got, like, a king-size Mr. Good Bar or a king-size, you know, thing at peanut M&M's, like, okay. Like, I, I get it. But uh, so just continue to pray about that event. Um, last week was a wonderful time uh, in the presence of the Lord as we, you know, started off this series, Bulletproof, and understanding the importance uh, you know, what, what really is spiritual warfare and why we have to be aware of it. We talked about the fact that walking in victory requires us to, uh, to acknowledge what the real struggle is. That spiritual warfare is real, that the devil is real, that demons are real, and that they are out to destroy us. And we also recognize that, you know, we can't be focused on the physical battle and lose the spiritual one. Remember, we talked about that church in Ephesus who, in the span of 30 years, lost the spiritual battle. They had persevered, but Christ judged them because they abandoned him. We know that we can't bring a knife to a gunfight, right? The devil wants to keep us distracted on the wrong battle. We know that the battle is not ours, but it is God's. Yet we are to, you know, share our, or give our strength to the Lord so that he can fight in us and for us and through us, that it is our role to surrender. We think about Jehoshaphat and what he said in his prayer. Remember, he said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, God. And that is the way that we need to pray as we approach spiritual warfare. And then lastly, and most encouragingly, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. And we talked about how the Bible just promises the victory that we walk in because the devil is already defeated, he is already lost. Scripture is just chock full of promises showing that the devil lost already and we can walk in victory. Well, over the next several weeks, we're going to be going through each of the elements of the armor of God. Um, in before first service, as the elders and deacons were praying over me, uh, they're like, okay, what are you preaching about today? And I said, well, we're talking about the, the belt of truth. And a few of them laughed and like, oh yeah, I gave my kids a dose of the belt of truth a few times when I was a dad, <laughs> you know, just laughing. And it made me think, yeah, I received the belt of truth a few times when, when I was a kid. There was one time, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I will. There was one time where my dad, you know, he sent me to my room and I was going to get a spanking. And, you know, he, he brings just like a regular belt. You know, and, and he spanks me, and I'm like, well, I'm just going to cry really easy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like, try to just act this up so that he can, you know, stop. And it worked. 
you know, I was, I was wailing, I was crying. And he kind of is like, okay, John got it. And so he steps out of the room and he must've come to his senses like, well, that was just too easy. And so he just waits outside of my door and hears me laughing at what I had gotten away with. Hey kids, don't do that. Just an FYI. But uh, no, so we're going to talk about the belt of truth and what, what that really means and what the, what the scriptures tell us about that. So let's give this time to God uh, if we can. Father, we come to you today and we worship you. Lord, we thank you. You are here. You are good. You are worthy of being worshiped. God, we lift your name on high. We magnify you in this place. We are ready, Lord, to receive the outpouring of your spirit. Lord, speak to us today. Prepare our hearts to receive from you. Show us what each of us can do. God, to make a step to you in our relationship. God, draw us close to you. Take away the distractions of this world. Confront us with your truth. Challenge us in the areas where we are compromising. God, show us, show us the change that you want to make in our hearts. And give us the boldness to give you the permission to do that, to step out of your way. Father, we lay down all of our distractions. We lay down everything that we came in these doors with today, Lord. And we look forward to what you're going to do. God, we look forward to what you are doing in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, as we talk about the belt of truth, it's about walking in the truth that, that the devil is already defeated, that Christ has already won the victory. And so Paul, when he talks about the armor of God, he says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And you might wonder, why does he start with the belt? Why does he start with the belt? Like when I got dressed this morning, the belt wasn't the first thing that I put on, right? And so why, why doesn't he even talk about clothes? And I think the reason is, is that there's honestly an implication that we're already dressed, that we're already clothed in righteousness. Listen to what it says in Isaiah. It says, I greatly delight, or I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, so we look at this and what we realize is that through Christ, we are given robes of righteousness. We are clothed in his righteousness. And this is important because without the righteousness of God, the armor of God is ineffective. The belt would just be a belt. The breastplate would just be a breastplate. The helmet would just be a helmet. The shoes would just be shoes. The sword would just be a sword. And the shield would just be a shield. But because of the sacrifice of God, and because when I walk in that, when I confess that he is my Lord, when I am clothed in garments of salvation, in robes of righteousness, the belt becomes the belt of truth. The breastplate becomes the breastplate of righteousness. The helmet becomes the helmet of salvation. The shoes become the shoes in the preparation of the gospel of peace. The, the shield becomes the shield of faith, and the sword becomes the sword of the Spirit. The problem is, Perhaps many of you this morning find yourself in a place where you've put on or you've tried to put on the armor of God, but you're naked underneath. You don't have anything else on. You're not clothed in the righteousness of God. You're not living according to his word. You're not living according to his will. And you wonder why the battle continues to overcome you. Before we can talk about the armor, before I can put the belt of truth on, I must be clothed in righteousness. And so the first step that we all have to take is, God, where have I fallen short? Where am I not walking according to your word? Where am I not walking according to your will? Where am I just naked? Where am I trying to live with just my dirty rags on? This is an important truth for us to understand as we move for forward. Because, you know, we can't put the belt of truth on without having this. Listen, the reason that Paul started with the belt Tony Evans said in his study that the belt is first because a soldier needs something secure to place his armor on. And that if the belt is off, if the foundation is off, the whole armor is rendered ineffective. And so we have to recognize, I got to be clothed in righteousness before I can put my belt on. So first, ask yourself that question. And second, let's figure out why it's called the belt of truth. One of the things that Tony Evans said in his study is that truth is the objective standard by which all reality is judged, and therefore it can only come from God since God created reality. You see, God is the only source of truth. He is the only one that we can go to and define truth. He's the only one that truth can be judged by. And Jesus himself said this about himself in John chapter 14. He said, I am the way, 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, this is when we go that way, what are we? We are clothed in righteousness. But what's important here is that Jesus, he doesn't say, I am a way. He doesn't say, I am a truth. He doesn't say, I am a life. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The problem is our world will try to present you know, ideas like universalism that says all paths lead to God. False. One path leads to God, and it is Christ. The world will also try and say that truth is relative, that what I believe is true for me, what you believe is true for you. No, no, Jesus is the truth. And without him, I can't get to the Father. He is the foundation that my life must be on. You see, the, the soldier has his belt because it's the foundation of his armor. I have the truth of God because it's the foundation of my life and my, the foundation of my walk with him. Jesus is my cornerstone. In Ephesians, it says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So what we recognize is that Christ is the truth upon which we build our relationship with God. He is the foundation that we must have in our life. Our belief in and our confession of his death and resurrection unite us with him and allow us to be the dwelling place of his spirit. You see, his spirit is a gift to us. Beyond the gift of his son, beyond the gift of his son's sacrifice, he gives his spirit to us. But we can't receive that until I have the appropriate foundation, until I'm clothed in righteousness and the foundation of my life is in the truth of God and in his son. This is the way that we have to walk. And the challenge is, in our world, in Jesus' world, this, the cornerstone has been rejected. In 1 Peter, it says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined to do. So we look at this and we recognize that not only do we see this happening in, our, in, in Christ's time, but in our time as well. This is, honestly, this is a beautiful prelude to that scripture that we've referred to so many times this year, and that we are a royal priesthood, a chosen people, God's, you know, a holy nation, God's special possession. But before all of that, God is saying that we are living stones, that he is living in us, and he wants to build us together as part of the body. But we can't do that. We can't be effective in that calling unless he is the foundation of us. He is the cornerstone. But he is the, the cornerstone that, that was chosen by God, rejected by humans. You see, this world refuses to accept the truth of who Christ is. Now, Peter said that for those of us that, that do believe, that do obey, we find him precious. But to the ones that disobey, the ones that do not believe, not only is he the cornerstone, but he is the one that makes them fall. And what I love about that is that just because they don't believe, guess what? He's still the cornerstone. He's still the cornerstone. The fact that they don't believe, the fact that they reject him, it doesn't reduce his character. It doesn't reduce his, his nature. It doesn't reduce the fact that he is God's son no matter what. In the world, especially the world that we live in, will try and tell you, that, well, that's just true for you. No, it's true for everyone if not a single soul that has ever lived on this earth never believed that Jesus was the son, he would still be the son of God. Would still be the son of God. But the, the world can't, can't even like fathom that because in their mind it's just, well, truth is relative. And so that's why he becomes the stumbling block. Because they just refuse to accept an absolute truth in who Jesus is. 
But their argument, the world's argument that truth is relative, it implodes upon itself. It doesn't stand up to logic. Because what they're saying, they're making a statement. You cannot have absolute truth. That statement by itself is an attempt at making an absolute truth. So it, th- their argument implodes upon itself. It doesn't stand up. But the challenge is, this is the tool that the devil is using to deceive people into believing that they don't have to look outside of themselves for truth. Listen, I can't look in here. I can't look in my flesh for truth. We talked a few weeks ago that our flesh is our point of weakness, that the, the mind that is governed by the flesh is what? It is dead. So if I look inside to my flesh for truth, I am spiritually dead. And this is what the, what the devil is wanting to get people to believe in. The, the, the issue is not just people, Christians. Matthew speaks, and so do many others in the New Testament. They warn against false teachers. Matthew says to be aware because they are deceiving even the elect. To put that in our vernacular, what he would be saying is we must be on our guard because even those who believe in Christ are being deceived, are being lulled to sleep and and, and believing that he's not coming or it's only true for us or all paths lead to God or any of these other lies, but Jesus is the truth. We have to become, or we have to refuse to become like the church or the people that were in Isaiah's day, in Isaiah chapter 30. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 30. We're going to read a passage there. It's also in you version if you're following along there. You should be able to find it. I'm going to start in verse 8. It says, go now. Write it on a tablet for them. Inscribe it on a scroll. That for the days to come it might be an everlasting witness. For these are a rebellious people, people, deceitful children, children unlistening, unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And they say to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path. And stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. It doesn't matter to me how much you try to beat me down. I will never stop confronting you with the Holy One of Israel. You have, my calling is to the Lord and to be obedient. And I'm not suggesting that that's what you were doing. What I am suggesting is we cannot become like them. Because in the previous chapter in Isaiah 29, God said that these are the people that they they come after me or they, they profess me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me that their worship of me is based only on rules that man taught them. Our worship is inspired by the Holy Spirit, drawn to God through him. I want to be confronted with truth. If I'm, out, if, if I'm off base, if I'm, if I'm not going in the right direction, I want God to tell me. And my heart and my, 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 my goal would be that each of you would have the same desire in your heart. You might say, well, John, that's the Old Testament. Now listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 4. It says, a time is coming and has come already when people will no longer pay attention to sound teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for for teachers who will only tell them what their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they will chase after myths. All you have to do is look around, media, social media, just walk around. And you see that that time has come. And why am I here? Why am I beating this drum? Because there are consequences when we choose to reject the truth. Back to Isaiah, starting in verse 12 of chapter 30. He says, therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, because you've relied on oppression and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall cracked and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattering so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from the hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. 
This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Like he even tells them in the midst of his judgment, this is how you can walk in salvation. This is how you can walk in rest. This is how you can walk in strength, in repentance, by turning away from that. But you would have none of it, he says. He said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. He said, we will ride, on, ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. So when I look at this, what I realize and what we must realize is that if we reject the truth, we will lose the battle. If you reject the truth of who God is, if you refuse to listen to him, if you refuse to be confronted with his truth, you will lose the battle. Clearly, This is not a place that I want to be. I don't want to, I don't want to walk into a situation knowing I'm going to be defeated because I've rejected the truth of who God is. If you want to walk in victory, we must walk in truth. So what does that look like? What does it look like to walk in truth? What does it mean to have the belt of truth buckled around our waist? Well, it comes from a Hebrew idiom called gird your loins. It says gird your loins. Anybody ever heard that phrase, gird your loins? So what it literally means is that they would take their, their robe and their cloak and they would you know, pull it up and then tie it around their waist or tuck it into their belt. Because they didn't wear pants, they wore these long robes and you know, running or a lot of movement or going into battle, you're going to trip. You're not going to be able to move. You're not going to be agile. And so when Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and the, you know, what they're hearing is gird your loins and they are saying, I got to get ready for battle. I got to get ready for movement. There's something ready ahead of me. And the only way that I can be ready for that is in a foundation of truth. So what is the truth that is our foundation that we must look to? It's God because his words are true. In 2 Timothy, it says, And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. A very familiar passage, but what it tells us is that the foundation that makes us battle ready is found in God because his words are true. You know what I love about this? It says that all scripture is God breathed. What that tells me is it brings life because what happened when God breathed into Adam? He came to life, he gave him life. So if God breathed the words that are in my Bible, when I read them, you know what I am receiving? I am receiving God's breath into my spirit. I am receiving his life into my heart and that is what I want to do. That is the way that I can be prepared for the battle that's ahead of me. We cannot reject this truth. It is useful for teaching for for preparing, for equipping, but it's also useful for rebuking and correcting. We can't have one without the other. I I told you that story about my dad. But what you need to understand is my dad, he wanted to teach me what was right and wrong. And he was not willing to let his boundaries fade so that I could be comfortable. He wanted to make sure that I understood what the path was. God wants to make sure that you know what the path is. And so he sets clear boundaries. And when we go out of them, we better expect that he will confront us with it. We must be sensitive. We must hear. We have to realize how important this is, because if we don't understand the word of God, if we are are not familiar with it, we won't be prepared for battle. We see this right from the beginning in Genesis chapter three. It says, now the servant was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit uh, from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Do you see what the devil has done here? Do you see what he is using as his weapon against Eve? He is using 
the word of God. He is saying, did God really say? You know what the world will use as its weapon against you? God's word. Does the Bible really say this? How can God claim to love us if he's going to send people to hell? How can God do that? How can God do this? Well, what does the Bible really say about that? I, I, I really I want your attention for just one moment because this is important. If you don't know the answer, hear me this morning. It's okay to say I don't know. Okay, because guess what? We have the source of the answer. We know that we can go to the scriptures. We can search for truth. Oftentimes, when we are confronted with a question that we don't know, we feel like if we don't give an answer, the person is going to judge our ignorance. That may be, but let that happen because that's going to be, a, a, it's going to be worse if we give them the wrong answer. I think rather what would happen is they would respect you more if you said, listen, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. But you know what? I know where to find the answer. Give me a little bit of time. I'm going to, I, want to, I want to search my Bible. I want to pray about it. I want to talk to God about it. And then we can have this conversation. That's the way. They, they will respect you because you know what? You're not looking and just going to pull something out of the air because what did Eve do? She pulled something out of the air. She added to God's word because she said, we're not allowed to touch it. I don't read that anywhere. I don't read that anywhere. Her unfamiliarity with the, with the scripture, your unfamiliarity with the scripture, it leaves you vulnerable to the enemy's attack. I'm so passionate about the Bible and about the, the words that are in it because it is what prepares us for battle. It brings life to us. God's desire, he gave it to us as a gift so that we could study it, we can meditate on it, and we can be prepared to go out. But as soon as Eve said that, well, we can't touch it, the devil knew it. He said, I got her. He knew we had her. Because she had twisted, she had added to God's word. We cannot do that. We must recognize the value of his word. Because if, when we recognize the value, when we've internalized it, we will be able to combat the world's lies. Because the world wants you to believe that your actions don't have any consequences. The world wants you to believe that eternity isn't real. The world wants you to believe that you're not going to answer to anyone. But you know what truth is? That there will be a day when you will stand eye to eye with Jesus Christ. The one who died on the cross for your sins. And he said, and other people said it in the Bible, that in that day, in that moment, you will be judged for everything that you have done. Whether right or wrong, good or bad. Truthfully, I'm not looking forward to that moment. I'm, listen, my place in, in eternity is secure. I confess that he is my Lord. I believe in his resurrection. I do everything I can to follow after him. I'm still not looking forward to that moment because I know how often I've failed. What I believe God is calling us today is that let's not forget about that moment. That there will be a time that, that the truth tells us that we will see Jesus face to face. Maybe you've believed the, the lie from the world that you're not worth anything. Maybe you believe the lie from the world that you're rejected and there's a reason behind it. Maybe you believe that you're a failure and you're always going to be a failure. Maybe you believe that the pain that you're carrying, you deserve to carry it. Maybe you believe that you're unlovable. Maybe you believe that the mistakes that you've made disqualify you from God's love. You know what the Bible says? You know what Jesus says? He says, you are worth it all. In the moment, it says before the foundations of the world, it says that Jesus was slain. What that tells me is before God even said, let there be light, Jesus says, I'm going to die for the people that need me to die for them. That's how much you are worth to God. That is what the truth of his word tells you. And that is what our foundation needs to be in our life. You see, his word is what makes us battle ready. Prepares us to go out into this world. We don't have to fight the battle. But it makes us ready to go through it and to stand firm. And this week for me, was a battle of sorts. It's had a lot going on. And, and I hate to wait until Thursday to write the message, but like Thursday is my drop dead day. 
because I got to get my notes to Julie on Friday so she can get them in the back of the bulletin. And, and the devil just had me distracted this week. It's like, well, you got to do this and you got to do that. You got to do this, you got to do that. I'm trying to keep my eyes and my, my, my mind and my spirit off of what God wanted for today. But I'm so glad that God can take what the devil wants for harm. I'm so glad that God can twist that around for his glory. Because Thursday morning, I was, I was thinking about this phrase, gird your loins. I was thinking about this phrase, take up your cloak and, and, and tuck it into your belt. And I remembered Exodus chapter 12. I remembered the rules that God gave as the first part, you know, for the Passover, the first Passover. He said this, in the first month of the year, you're going to take a lamb on the 10th day, and you're going to take care of it for four days. This lamb has to be perfect. It has to have no flaws. On the, 14th, on the 14th of the month, after you've taken care of the lamb for four days, you're going to sacrifice the lamb. You're going to take its blood. You're going to spread its blood on the lintels and the, and the doorposts of your home. And then you're going to roast the entire lamb over a fire. You're not going to boil it. You're going to roast it. And you're going to eat the whole thing with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. He said that if there is anything left over in the morning, you are to burn it because there's nothing left of this. There is no waste. And then, are you ready? He said this. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. You see, what I got from this is that truth, it brings freedom and it brings deliverance from our sin. Not only does truth prepare me for the battle, not only does truth prepare me for victory, truth frees me from what I'm struggling with every single day. You see, these Israelites, they were slaves for 400 years. And God said, you tuck this in your belt because tomorrow you are free. I asked you last week, are you ready to be in victory? Today, I want to know, are you ready to be free? Because if you are, set your foundation in Christ. Set your foundation in his word. Let him be the cornerstone of your life and watch. Watch what he does for you. Watch how he changes you. Watch how he uses you. It's all during the transformation. So often we think that we can't because I'm not good enough. Listen, God can use you while he transforms you. How do I know that? Because he's done it with me. He's used me, he's used others to speak to me from their point of weakness because he's the one that gets the glory anyways. Not me, not you, him. So my question, are you ready to walk in freedom? Are you ready to walk in deliverance? Set your foundation in truth. So if we're to take our stand against the devil, we have to ask and answer some questions. First and foremost, are you clothed in righteousness? Or do you have the armor of God on and you're naked underneath? We must surrender our hearts, our minds, our spirits, everything to God. Let him come in and save you. Let him come in and transform you. Is Christ your foundation of truth? Are you looking for truth inside of yourself? Listen, you can't look for truth inside of yourself. He is the only source of truth. Are you meditating on the truth of God's word? If you're not in the Bible, if you're not reading the Bible, listen, listen, I beg of you, beg of you to read his word, to study it, to meditate on it. It will change you. It will change you. And then lastly, what do you need to be delivered from today? As we pray, I want you to focus on these questions. If you haven't ever been saved, if you've never received that gift, if you say, John, I've never been clothed in righteousness. Today is the day of salvation. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't wait a moment. Run to him. Run to him. And you know what he will do? He will come running to you with his arms wide open. If there's something that you need to be free from, 
make today the day that you lay the foundation of your life and your walk with God and the truth of who Christ is in his word. This is a moment of transformation. This is a pivot point in our history. If you want tomorrow to be different, today something has to change. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your son, that he died for us, that he came, that he was slain from the foundations of the world, God. Someone in here needs to know that. Someone in here needs to embrace that, God. Let them feel the tug on their heart. Let them feel just you drawing to them, Lord. Make today a day of change for them. God, we need to be confronted with your truth. Forgive us for the times that we have put our hands up and said, stop. Forgive us for that, Lord God. Bring our arms down. Bring our resistance down. Break our defenses, Lord, so that we can hear you. We can receive from you. We can be changed by you, God. Not for our glory, but for yours. God, there are those here that are struggling. There, are, there is addiction. There is temptation. There is sin that we continue to fall into. It's a pattern. God, we want to break the pattern. The way that we do that, Lord, God, help us to realize that it's through your truth. God, we know what those things are. Let us see the difference between the pain in the midst of our struggle and the freedom that comes when our foundation is in you, Lord. Draw us to that place of, of deliverance, God. Help us to step out and walk in that freedom and victory that only comes from you. God, we thank you and we praise you for everything. We worship you today. God, continue to work in our hearts as we sing, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.